So, what do you guys want to talk about? That's a great question. Nice. It's a really good question. <laughs> I've been stewing on uh, something you said for uh, you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip. Grew up with that phrase. Mm -hmm. God, I wish I'd have put it together the way you put it, though. You can't squeeze death out of God. God oh don't have goodness. it. I mean, I mean, it was so amazing. Yes. That was, mm -hmm. like, that was one of those just, life changers, huh? Right? It just like, man, you hear that death phrase death your whole life, and yeah. you know, and then, oh man, I wish I'd have known that back then. But yeah. it don't matter. And it's a, no, it's a, it's a simple, but it's a profound thing. That Do you is. think you can trust somebody that has death in themselves to give you? And going to be happy to give it to you. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, we, we, don't don't, we don't trust Satan because we know that he has death in him, but we somehow imply that God right. has death in him. Right. So... And back to the question, do we, it doesn't matter how bad we want to trust God, do we think that our heart is able to trust somebody <laughs> that we think has death or punishment inside of themselves to give us? I like your other example that you've given so many times about if, if your daughter wants to marry this serial killer, <laughs> you tell the story better than I do, but, you know, of course we, even though he says, well, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm all done killing people. I've, I've changed my ways. You still don't want your daughter to marry. hook up with them. No. Right. Think, think about just with our spouses. Mm. Curious how bad we struggle to trust our spouses? I mean, what's the dating process? What are we doing? We're scrutinizing them to see if we can trust them with our life. Mm -hmm. right. right? And we're like busy un looking under the rocks. Is there any improprieties there? Is there anything going on? And what is it? I mean, why is it that we marry somebody? Yeah, we love them, but... The reason why we're marrying them, the, the premise there is that we, we find that there's no malice in their heart towards us. That they don't possess an ability to do us harm. Right. right? They don't want to do us harm. And then what happens is, is that's designed to bring something forth in you where you're able to give yourselves wholly over into the other person's arms. Right? That, that's a dynamic that doesn't just exist with God, but it exists with humans. Right? So the moment we think God has death in himself to give us, or we think that he's got punishment inside of himself to give us, then it don't matter how bad we want to trust God, right. we're not going to be able to. Right. Because it, it works against the design of human beings. It works against the design of man. And if you think it doesn't, then I'll just encourage you, try and trust somebody w with your life, or try and trust somebody uh, that is always harming you. Right. Yeah. In fact, what do we say? we got to have boundaries. <laughs> don't we come talking about how we got to have boundaries against those people that harm us and listen it ain't even just the ones that we say try to harm us we, we got we all got friends and family members that we know they mean well but nonetheless they still harming us <laughs> right and then we have our boundaries why because we have to protect ourselves from the harm that can come and we don't realize that we got the same dynamic going on with God right and it hasn't come from us, it comes from the, the devil, Satan, the serpent, the adversary, the snake, the dragon, whatever you want to call it. What he's done is, is he corrupted his wisdom. And he said, I'm going to exalt myself. I'm going to build myself a life apart from God. That life's going to be so beautiful that it will exalt me above mankind. Right? Well... His system can't bring forth life because he doesn't have life within himself. So guess what his system brought forth? Death. So he brought death into the earth, and then he got humans to believe that God was the one giving them the death. Right? Because he understands the dy dynamic I just described. We got God as like the crazy uncle or the, the friend that just won't get it together and is all the time stealing from us or hurting us or wrecking our car when we lend it to him or whatever you want to call it. And so, just like we put up boundaries, when we see people in our lives that want to hurt us, our hearts do it just on their own. The same kind of ha things happen with God, where a boundary's been built up in our heart because we don't know if we can actually trust Him with our life. Right. We don't know if we can actually bear our soul to this guy, right? Because what if He sees some of our fears and insecurities? What if He sees something in us that isn't exactly right? What if He sees something in us that hasn't come from Him that maybe has come from the world? And if we think that there's punishment or death in Him to give to us, then we're going to have a boundary in our heart. We're only going to let Him so much in, right? And we're not going to be able to actually trust Him with our life, right? Because trusting God with your life means you know that this guy can only ever be good to your life. Right. You're not going to trust your life with somebody that you think possesses the ability to hurt you. 
You're just not. Right. It's impossible. You'd be stupid. You'd be stupid. <laughs> and so th this is one of the main things the gospel had to do. God saw that humans were dying. Not because he killed them, because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that tree can't give life, it gives death. And so once death got planted in the earth, God had a problem. Because humans weren't just dying, they were dying, and Satan got it right to convince the humans that God was the one killing them. That the death they were suffering was on account of God. Abandoning them, leaving them, punishing them for their sin. Where's your God now? If he really is for you, let him come for you. Isn't that what he said to Jesus? And so God had a couple of problems. Here we are dying. That was enough of a problem. The next thing is, he's the only one that can save us from death. Because the only thing he has in himself is life. And, so, and it's only his life that can actually conquer the death. The problem is, we are running away from him because we think he's the one spanking us. Yes. Every exactly. time. I mean, how many times do you hear in the earth, every time there's a calamity, it's an act of God? It's even in our insurance policies. Yep. Right. In our homeowner's insurance, an act of God. And so the coronavirus, it's God. I mean, we have whole groups that we come together. We're going to pray for the land to be healed because we think God's the one that sent the plague. And so God's like, this is a problem. Because how can I save them with my life if they won't come to me? So God's like, all right, I see these guys think I'm the one serving them with death. We're going to enter into their darkness so we can blow it up from the inside out. We're going to come and stand in their midst, right? And that's Jesus becoming flesh, the incarnation, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, everlasting father, it says about Jesus entering the earth, God with us. So here we have this whole image of God that he's got within himself death to give us. And now God's like, okay, here I am. Here I am. Now how many sinners did Jesus turn his back on? None. How many people did Jesus serve with death? Stone. None. How many people did Jesus give a sickness to? None. How many people did Jesus condemn? None. How many people did Jesus accuse? None. How many people's nakedness did Jesus uncover? None. Okay, well, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right. And in fact, what Jesus did as the Father is he actually removed that which was accusing us. Right. He actually justified us in the face of the accusation that was coming against us. He removed the sentence of death that was hanging over us. And then he says to the people, listen, man, it's not me that comes to steal, kill, and destroy from people when they'll find them in their sin. It's the serpent. It's the thief that steals and kills and destroys. When I am come, when I manifest myself in the midst of sinners, I'm come to conquer their death and give them eternal life as a gift. Yeah. That's why he says, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. John said Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world to save the world. And he says the world was already standing in condemnation. Right. Do you know why they were standing in condemnation? Because the death that came from the thief was reigning over us. Mm -hmm. We had a sentence of death hanging over us because of the thief, not because of God. Right. Now God's like, God doesn't just come to you and say, trust me, man. <laughs> What's wrong with you? You think God don't know how human work? <laughs> No more than the watchmaker doesn't know how the watch works. You, exactly. I remember when I was uh, courting Becky. Imagine I come and tell Becky, just trust me. Well, we hear that all the time. Listen, man, she had, a whole, she had a whole lifetime of experiences that taught her, don't trust nobody. Lest you be made a fool of. Lest they harm your life. Because she had a whole lifetime of people harming her life. Right? So if I come and tell her, just trust me. I'm righteous. Mm. That wasn't going to work. Right. But if I could reveal my heart to her, and she could examine it, and she could see that was, there was no darkness in my heart, and she could see that there was no death in my heart, if she could see that my heart wasn't filled with uh, hatred and envy and, and punishment and all those kinds of things, and she could see my heart was only filled with loving kindness, that would bring something forth in her where she found herself trusting me where it happened to her trust with god is something that happens to you when you're presented with the correct knowledge of who god is amen so it's not that you must trust god it's that let god show you who he is and as you scrutinize who he is and the way you scrutinize who god is isn't by your own vain imagination about what's written in the scriptures it's about beholding god in the face of jesus christ he's god 
And you scrutinize your thoughts about God by looking at Jesus. Now, as we scrutinize God and we see that, my goodness, this guy doesn't have any darkness in him. So you first see it in Jesus, then you start seeing it everywhere in the scriptures, right? John come and said, God is love. He come and said that there is no darkness in God. Darkness is death in the scriptures. Day though I walk through the valley shadowed by death. Our understanding about God was darkened by the death that entered the world. Mm -hmm. Then we hear James come and say, let no person say when they encounter tribulation that God's the one that sent it. Right. Does this, how come we never heard about that <laughs> in Sunday school? Right. How come we only heard about the God that's going to punish us for our sin? Right. So James come and say, let nobody say when tribulation, when they encounter tribulation, that God's the one that sent it for God, only good and perfect gifts come from the Father of lights. Notice how lights. he uses the word light. Yes. The Father right. of lights. He's saying the same thing John said. And then he goes on to say, in whom there's no shadow of turning. In whom there's no ability for this guy to give you anything other than a good and perfect gift. Right. Because, just like you can't get blood out of a turnip, you can't <laughs> get death out of life. Did you see? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, when we can see this thing about God... What happens is, is our hearts begin to go to rest in this guy's integrity towards our lives. As our hearts go to rest in his integrity towards our lives, our flesh goes to rest. And what happens is, is we find all the works of the flesh that have manifested in our lives from us trying to preserve our own lives, we find those things falling away. Do you know why the work, I mean, even the things in your life that you don't like, do you know what, where they're born from? They're born from you trying to preserve your own life. They're born from you trying to give yourself life. They're born from you trying to gather peace and love and joy to yourself. Right? That's how those things come out. Well, guess what happens when you see that God will bring you peace and love and joy? You stop trying to gather it yourself. Right. Guess what happens when you are convinced of God's integrity towards your life? You stop trying to preserve your own life. And guess what happens? The fruit of the flesh no longer has an opportunity to come forth in you because you're not looking to your own ability to preserve your own life. Right. And what happens is, is as your heart goes to rest in the integrity of God and his intentions towards your life, it becomes a tree of life inside of you, right? And you're filled with peace and love and joy, mm -hmm. right? A person filled with peace and love and joy doesn't need to be told, thou shalt not kill. Right. <laughs> Exactly. For there's no reason to kill. Oh my gosh. A person so that's filled with a heart of abundance doesn't need to be told, thou shalt not steal. For what would a person have a need to steal if they think they have everything? Right? right. And so we become confused about how life works and how death works. And we become confused about how God brings forth life in us. We become confused about the dynamics of those things. Right? Yeah. And because we, we don't like death. Do you guys realize we don't like death? Mm -hmm. You guys realize that in, even in our hearts, when something is the fruit of death, it speaks a silent word to us. We don't like that either. Right. And guess what? We think if we don't like it, surely God doesn't like it. And if it's in us or coming out of us and we don't like it, God must not like it. And then we make the unrighteous conclusion, God doesn't like us. Right? <laughs> oh, wretched man that I am. Exactly. And then we start trying to clean up our act so we can be presentable to God. We think if we can clean ourselves up nice enough, then we can come and show God, look at me. Aren't I lovely? Right? right. right? Yeah. Look, and I've served, and I've tithed, and I've done all of I've these done things. done all the stuff. All of this in your name, just so you can love me. Real all the while, God's like, listen, man. Um, I don't know if you realized it, but you came into the earth naked. I don't know if you realize it. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't ashamed of your nakedness. Right. I wasn't ashamed of your inability to clothe yourself with life. I wasn't ashamed that you didn't possess the ability to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. I wasn't ashamed of that. I knew that I needed to clothe you. Yeah, that's right. And so I'm not ashamed of you in the day I find you naked. I'm not ashamed of you in the day I find you in sin. I'm not ashamed of you in the day that you're dead in your sin. Because I realize the only way you could find yourself there is if your heart is struggling to trust me. And so I don't see the answer is to punish you. I see the answer is to reveal my unending kindness towards you. Because me punishing you can never convince you to trust me with your life. 
Me loving you in the face of you thinking you, you deserve punishment is what will cause you to trust me with your life. Right? right? It's a simple thing. See, we judge everything from the outside. Jesus said, I judge no person after the flesh. Right. So he sees into the heart, and even should he see the fruit of death coming out of us, he knows the problem is they're struggling to trust me with their life. And so he sees the answer is, let me persuade them they can trust me with their life. Yeah. That's the answer. The answer is let me persuade them they can trust me with their life. Again, back to human relationships. How, how is a human persuaded they can trust someone with their life? To see that that person has no ability to do them harm. Mm-hmm. One of my, my best friends, his name's Fan. <clears throat> he's kind of like a maniac, right? He's rowdy. He's had anger issues for a number of different reasons, which, which I won't get into today. This guy has lots of problems uh, in his life. I met this guy when he was beating up somebody else, right? Now, for some reason, this guy took a liking to me. I still don't know why he took a liking to me. But this guy would actually lay down his life for me. And there was one day I was going to put it to the test. And so we're out on Bourbon Street or the French Quarter late at night, and I'm all shoving him. And I hit him. And he's just laughing. And he just bear hugs me and squeezes me and says, I could never lift a hand to you. Right? Now, still to this day, I'll say I have one friend that would lay down his life for me and wouldn't think twice about it. And I know that guy could never do me any harm. I've been fully persuaded because it's been put to the test. Right? It's been put in the fire. And that's what happens with God. God doesn't have a problem proving to you that he doesn't possess the ability to harm your life. He doesn't have a problem with it being put to the test. I mean, we forget that Jesus is God. And we think that God becomes so upset when we transgress him. We think God becomes so upset when we sin. Well, there's Jesus. He's God. And we nailed him to a tree. What did he do? He loved us anyway. Did he come down off the tree and whoop us? Nope. (laughs) Because that's God. We conveniently forget that's God. Mm -hmm. The God-man, mm-hmm. wonderful counselor, prince of peace, everlasting father. That's what it, Isaiah says that Jesus is. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Philip said, show us the father. Jesus said, how long have I been with you, man? If you've seen me, you've seen the father. <laughs> and so Jesus is like, these guys think that I, I possess something in myself where I'm going to punish them for their sin. Right. Let's, we're going to put that on display in their midst. There's Jesus. He's God. Right. What do we do to God? I mean, listen, did God do anything to us? No. I mean, there's God walking around healing us from sin, right. healing right. us from sickness, protecting us against the accusers. There's God defending our name, defending our honor, just like David came and defended the Israelites against Goliath. There's God. And what do we do to God? We nail him to a tree. Right. We curse him. We pulled his beard out. We mocked him. We spit on him. We flogged him to death. What did God do? Did he punish us? No. Did he curse us? No. Did he smite us? Mm -mm. No. Do you know what he did? He turned the other cheek. He said, because he got, he understood what was happening to us. And he hurt more for us than he hurt for himself when when we were nailing him to a tree. I promise you, if God had the ability to do some harm to you, he would have done it when we nailed him to a tree. But he didn't. Did he? It says that Jesus prayed for those that cursed him. It said he blessed those who despitefully used him. It says he turned the other cheek. And then it goes on to say that that is the righteousness of the Father that was manifested in him. That means it was the revelation of the Father's heart towards humans, even should he find them dead in their sin. God's the good Samaritan. I can never get over that, Bobby, ever since that come out. I love, that just means something to me, like God being the good Samaritan, right? Because we had God as like the thief, yeah. right? That, right? That found us dead in our sin and then left us beaten and bloodied on the road because he couldn't stand to look upon us. But God's the good Samaritan, who when he found, finds us dead in our sin from the thief, he picks us up and fills us with the wine of his life. He makes a place for us in his house, and he brings us into his house. Isn't that what God did with Jesus? Isn't that what he did? Yes. Didn't he come and pick Jesus up 
Out of the grave? Didn't he fill Jesus with the wine of his life? Mm -hmm. Jesus, the Son of Man and the Son of God. Right. And so, man, as you behold these things about God, your heart begins to be put to rest. God doesn't despise the romance. He doesn't despise the dance. He does not despise unwinding the hurt in your heart, the distrust in your heart, the pain in your heart. He sees that from the time you were born into this world, this world has come and tried to destroy your life. Right. And he sees all the hurt and pain this world has brought to you. And he sees that that has conditioned you to lack the ability to trust. Mm -hmm. And so he says, it's okay if you don't possess the ability to trust me. I possess the ability to bring forth trust in you. <laughs> yes. Yes. However much I trust God, it ain't come from me. Right. I promise you that. It's come from him. Right? And then, so whatever it is you don't like in your life, I promise you guys at the root of it is you're struggling to trust God with your life. And this world does everything it can to convince you, you got to protect your own life. It does. Mm -hmm. And so God comes to the earth through Jesus. He pours out the Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Son, the Spirit that manifested in the Son towards the world. And what He does is, is He romances our hearts. Right? He comes and saves us from the, the suitor in the world that's abused us, right. that's neglected us, that's hurt us. And that's blamed it on God. Right. Here I am. Jesus, what? God with us. Mm -hmm. God with us. God with us. If you want to know what God looks like, there's Jesus. God with us. Right? That's one of the most powerful things you can even have in your life. You don't have to understand all types of uh, doctrinal things and, and scripture verses. You can, if that's in your heart. But you could just understand that Jesus is the only revelation about God. And you can weigh everything you think about God next to Jesus. And that will be enough mm -hmm. to begin to heal your heart. Yeah. Jesus said in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. Yes. Hebrews comes and says, God, who in sundry times, times in the past, spoken, spoke to us through the fathers and the patriarchs, has in these last days spoken to us through His Son. And then he goes on to say that the Son is the express image of God. What that means is, is within the Son, and what was revealed in the Son, is everything there is to be known about God. Yes. There is nothing to be known about God outside of what was revealed in Jesus. And that everything that could ever be said about God, thought about God, should be weighed against the revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Mm. Because what that does to us all the time is it continuously ministers to our hearts that God is good. Yes. That God cares more about our life than his own life. That he rather die himself than allow us to die. That he'll never turn his back on us. He'll never be ashamed of us. He'll never be the one uncovering our nakedness. I mean, he come and told Adam when Adam was naked, and Adam thought God was the one that uncovered his nakedness, and Adam was filled with fear and hiding from God. He come and said, said who told you you were naked? Right. It wasn't me. I didn't come pointing at your nakedness. So who is it that filled you with fear? Was it me? Am I the one that produced the fear in you? No, no, no. Right? But Adam certainly thought he should be afraid of God. Yes. But God was the one that clothed him, isn't he? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. right. And then we think, well, but God put Adam out of the garden. It wasn't out of anger. It was out of love. He said, "Let our man has now joined himself to death. Lest he eat from the tree of life now and remain in a state of death for all eternity, let us keep him from the tree of life. Let us keep him from the, from the tree of life until we can come, divorce him from death, and then he can be joined to us in our eternal life. Yes. That's called love. It's not called anger. Right. Right. Listen, I spent my whole life trying to clean up my act, and I got a lot of discipline. And so there was, I had nice stretches where I'd clean up my act, and then, oh, you do good, and then, oh. It's like eating or working out. You do good, and then, oh. oh that's right. You do good, oh. oh. Right? But when I, when, when I, uh, what I realized is all my working to clean up my act was either to make someone else happy or to make God happy. And once I let go of all that, I let go of thinking, I have to make God happy. Once I let go of that idea, I started hanging out with God. 
And I saw in hanging out with God, just like when I was hanging out with my friend Fan, there's no darkness in this guy towards me. Even when I smacked him upside his face in front of all of his friends, the tough guy. The guy whose whole reputation was that he's a badass. I smacked him upside his face in front of all of his friends in the French Quarter. And he was even inebriated. And he wouldn't lay a hand on me. Did you do that on purpose just to see what his reaction yeah. would be? Yeah. I thought for sure. Mad at him. Oh, yeah, I was angry. I thought for sure I'm going to get this guy to hit me. <laughs> Seriously, that's what I thought. That was a good picture, Wendy. Yes. You begin to hang out with God, and just like that, you begin to see this guy only has goodness in his heart towards you, that even when <laughs> you think you transgress him, he still only has goodness in you. How are you going to harm God? He's got an incorruptible life. <laughs> you really think you can take from God? Yeah, say that again, because that's really powerful. How are you going to harm God's life? Yeah. Do you know what grieves God's heart? When he can't be with you. Yeah. When you're running from him in fear. You know why it grieves his heart? Because he just wants to be with you, right? Yes. That's what grieves his heart. In fact, that's what it says in Luke when it says Jesus came into the earth. When you go and look at that in the Greek, when the angel said glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Was anybody a believer then or were we all dead in sin when it says God was filled with goodwill towards men? All dead. You know what that word goodwill in the Greek means? It means to be filled with favor towards somebody because you miss them. Because you're sad that they're not near you and you wish that they were. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. David comes and said in Psalms 8, Who is man that thou art mindful of him, right. that you visitest him? That word visitest in the Hebrew means David asked God. He saw all the beauty in creation. David saw himself and he thought he was a worm. Look at me. Look at my bad behavior. Look at my nakedness. Look at all my faults. Why is your mind filled with me and not the waterfalls or the stars or the sky? Or all of these beautiful things in creation, right? What is it about me that you miss me when I'm gone? Mm -hmm. That you feel as if something's just not right when I'm not there? What is it about me? Right? Yeah. Ask God that question. <laughs> Stop trying to figure out what you think about yourself and ask God what he thinks about you. Right? And don't... You can hear God, God audibly. I've heard God audibly, but if I'm being honest, what humans call audible, what my natural senses call audible, I maybe think I've heard from God twice. And I don't really know if it was audible. It might have just been so loud that it felt like it was audible. But man, as you communicate with God, don't communicate with God as if he's outside of you. He's inside of you. Mm -hmm. And you don't understand sometimes all the things inside of you that need to be sorted out before you can hear his answer. Right. And so if you don't think you hear something audibly like that, that doesn't mean God's not in there and that he's not going to quicken the answer inside of you. Just keep walking with God and talking with God. He's sorting it out. The number of things God was sorting out in my heart, the whole, my whole life with him, man, is astronomical. And I promise you, the whole time he was sorting it out, I thought he was not doing anything. Where are you, God? <laughs> right. And then after, you look back and you think, oh, man. Oh, yeah. I see back then when I thought you weren't doing anything. Oh, I see all the things you were doing. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's when humans become frustrated with another human. Right? Don't they listen? That's right. <laughs> but God doesn't feel frustrated. He's like, no, you don't understand. I enjoyed all that. I didn't despise you when you were angry with me, thinking that I wasn't talking with you, or I wasn't helping you, or I wasn't communicating with you, or that I wasn't with you. It didn't make me angry that you felt that way. I understand why you feel that way. Yeah. It was my good pleasure to chase you. It's my good pleasure to come after you. Just like Adam when he saw Eve. Whoa, man. <laughs> I know that's so cheesy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, so good, though. That's what God felt when he saw when he sees. Whoa, man! Right, right. So I got to share yesterday with the group that, you know, when we become believers, we have now the belief system of God in our hearts that's there through the Holy Spirit. But we're also still we're not. That's not a pure. It's pure unto itself, but it's not pure in our hearts because we believe lies, right? And we still have a lot of that stuff that's in there. Because we were talking about, well, once you become a believer, then you're not going to curse, you're not going to do that, you know, all of those, all of the physical fruit or the fruit of behavior that comes out of, a, you know, God's belief system as opposed to Satan's. But then when you, when you end up with the wrong belief system taking charge for a moment and you end up with the fruit of the flesh coming out, 
then you, then you figure, well, what's what's going on? What's wrong? And I get this, I told him, I said, look, it's not pure. It's a mixture at that point where you have lies that have basically contaminated your heart. That God's going to persuade you of what the truth is with respect to those lies, and He's going to remove those lies from you. It's not up to you to do that, but it's up because He loves you so much. He wants to do that, and all you need to do is just let Him. Uh, because there's there's for all of the men in that group to, to think about, well, what they look for fruit, right? They want to see what the fruit is. They want to, the evidence is what they see in people's behavior as opposed to the belief system in their heart. Yeah. And Jesus fruit says, inspectors. I judge nobody after the flesh. Exactly. Right. 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 Fruit inspectors. Right. Humans judge after the flesh. Yes. He says, you judge after right. the flesh. Mm-hmm. I judge no one after the flesh. Do you know what the Pharisees thought about Jesus when Mary was washing his feet? I, listen, Jesus didn't dress like us. He wasn't wearing jeans. His pants weren't closed right there. He had like a tunic, like a skirt. What do you think it looked like when a prostitute was kneeled down in between his legs washing his feet? Yeah. What do you think the Pharisees thought of that? Mm-hmm. Why do you think the Pharisees called Jesus a glutton and a wine bibber? Why do you think they called him that? You know what a glutton is? It ain't what we think a glutton is. <laughs> to the Pharisees, a glutton was somebody that ate with the unclean that ate with sinners, that made his <coughs> the table with the sinners. Really? And a wine bibber, a drunkard. Mm-hmm. You know what Jesus says? Well, John the Baptist come not eating or drinking, and you rejected him. The Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and you reject him. So which is it? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you who judges after the flesh. I judge no man after the flesh. Right. Jesus even said, I didn't come to make clean the outside of the cup. I come to make clean the inside of the cup. And if the inside of the cup can be made clean, guess what will happen? The outside of the cup will be clean. And so we're all the time focusing on the outside of the cup. And God's all the time looking at what's inside of the cup. And when he's looking at what's inside of the cup, he's specifically looking at the reasons why we don't trust him. And he's specifically ministering to those places to persuade us to trust him. It, It really speaks volumes to that, that we've gotten, our conscience has become so seared by uh, death and sin that we're even all the time busy talking about cursing. Yeah. As if God is offended by cursing. Right. Now listen, don't misunderstand me. If the life of God is born in you and you should be around some people that uh, don't enjoy cursing, you'll find that you don't curse right. because you'll prefer them over yourself. But you're not going to be offended if should you be around people that are all the time cussing. Thou shalt not cuss? What verse is that? <laughs> it's not in the Bible. No. You know, I mean, the, the, the closest you can get is let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Right. Yeah. It goes on to describe corrupt communication not by whether or not you're cursing. It's talking about what you say about God. Yes. <laughs> and whether you say he's full of grace or you say he's full of punishment. Mm. That's corrupt communication. To say that when you encounter tribulation, God's the one that sent it to you, that's corrupt communication. So when the coronavirus has come, right? Many well-intentioned people that don't know God will come together and say God sent the coronavirus. That's corrupt communication. You're blaspheming the name of God. You're attributing death to God. That's what you're doing, right? That doesn't possess the ability to produce trust in someone's heart. You know, the Old Testament is riddled with the Israelites suffering at the hands of death from Babylon and then them crying out to God. And you know what it says every time? That their hearts never actually trusted in God. They just cried about the pain they were feeling under Babylon. You know why? Because they thought God was responsible for the pain. And so they never were able to trust God. Jesus come and said, you confess me out of your mouth, but your heart is far from me. When he says your heart is far from me, it means that their heart is not resting in God. Their heart is not believing that God is with them to serve them with life. That God is with them to wash their feet. That God is with them to defend them, to uphold them, to be their advocate. That's what it means. Your heart is far from me. Your heart doesn't know me at all. Because if it did, you would never be worshiping the works of your own hands. You would never be standing in my presence trying to tell me about all the good that you did, but you'd be standing in my presence talking with me about the good that is the life that I've given you as a gift. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
Can we go back to the cussing a minute? Oh, oh. I just have to tell you a cute story. <laughs> this is a commercial break. All the years I was growing up. It's going international. It's all, right. it's all right. All the years I was growing up, my mom would get so upset and she would say, Haragud. Well, she was Swedish. And so I said, we always said, Mom, what is Haragud? She says, oh, it means for goodness sakes. <laughs> so when I became an adult, I found out she was cussing. <laughs> Haragud means holy God <laughs> in Swedish. <laughs> she was cussing. <laughs> she just didn't want us to know she was cussing. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you cuss or don't cuss is neither good or evil. It's irrelevant. Right? right? Yeah. Right. Right? So if I'm around people that it, they get upset if they're cussing, I don't need to cuss. Right. I have life in God, not in cussing. <laughs> but should I be around people that, man, they're like sailors? Hallelujah, I can enjoy that and have fun with those guys too. And shuck it up. Right? Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, that's how you get somewhere with people with Mardi Gras. You don't go down there with signs telling people repent or they're going to go to hell. You know what you do? You go down to Mardi Gras and you hang out with all the people and you're having fun with the people and you're just one of the people. And next thing you know, what do you do, man? Oh, I'm the pastor of a church. What? <laughs> that, their whole theology about God just got blown up. Yes, it did. And now they want to know about God. Right. Right? I didn't have to go down there and beat God down their throat. They've already had that happen. I promise you. Yeah, yeah. I promise you. That's a great example, Cindy. So I hope people don't understand what I'm saying about the cussing. I'm not telling you to go around and cuss everybody out. I'm just saying that the idea that we're even looking at that as a sign of whether or not somebody has faith, woe is us. I mean, you can broaden it. It's like smoking, going to R-rated movie, going dancing. Same difference. Yeah, you know, rock music. It, you know, it, it all fits in that same Same way. difference. Yes. Yeah. The idea that any of that stuff would be a sign of whether someone has faith or not is ludicrous. Yes. It's religious. It demonstrates a complete and total lack of knowledge of God. Now, that doesn't mean that, man, that uh, you might not breathe well if you smoke all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that God's judging you, No, right? I mean, listen, I smoked pot for a lot of years. And when I was doing it, I liked it. I just got to be honest, I found it made it hard for me to breathe, <laughs> right? But we don't need to confuse that with God. Right. And what God thinks of us, or whether we have faith or not. Right? right. Does that make sense? Yes. I remember telling God sometimes, I just like it, man. <laughs> you come to the place where you just think, I just like it, bro. God's like, well, I'm glad you can finally tell me. <laughs> <laughs> that demonstrates great growth in your heart. Because <laughs> you realize I'm not ashamed of you or it. Thank you. Can we just get on now? Right. Real life, God sitting around thinking, I wonder when they're going to tell me. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're all, trying, we're all the time self loathing about, but, oh, we got to make sure God knows we don't like it. You know, make sure God knows we're very dissatisfied with ourselves so we can think we're good little boys and girls. Nah, I just like it, man. <laughs> like, he doesn't know. All right. I remember after I told him that, listen, man, I just like it. And then afterwards, I'm like, like he didn't know that all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, some of the conversations we have with God are so silly, you know, yeah, from, right. not from his perspective, but, you know, from our perspective. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes some sense. Oh, it's wonderful. That doesn't mean that if you reject God and reject eternal life, <laughs> that there isn't a punishment. It's just, it doesn't come from God. Yeah. Right? right. If God's the only one who has life in himself, if you reject that life, what do you think you get? Death. death. That doesn't mean God's the one that gave you the death. Right. That means you don't have life in yourself. So you have nothing left to do but return to the dust of the ground. If you don't have life in yourself, and you don't have union with the one who does have life in himself, guess what you're left with? You're going to return to the dust of the ground. Right. From the dust of the ground you came, and from the dust of the ground you'll return. That doesn't mean God's the one who put you there. In fact, the fact it says God has no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Right. It says God, it says in the days of Noah. Do you know how long it took Noah to build the ark? 125. 120 years. years. You know what it says Noah was telling the people the whole time? It says he was a preacher of God's righteousness towards the people. Listen, man, God's heard our cries. 
He's seen our suffering. It grieves his heart that we're filled with laboring and toiling for life. He sees the death in the world is God us laboring and toiling and living by the sweat of our brow. He's going to cleanse the earth from sin and death. But he doesn't want us to perish with the sin and the death. So he's got me building this ark so that we can be pitched within and without from the end that's coming to death. Mm -hmm. 120 years he did that. You know what Peter said about that? God was long-suffering, not willing that anyone should perish. He says, in the days of Noah, when an end was coming to the old world, God was long-suffering, not willing that anyone would perish. So he had Noah build an ark. And he had Noah tell the people that God wanted to preserve their lives from the end that's coming to sin and death. Peter even comes and says that Noah and the eight were saved by the flood. Saved by the flood. Right. Right. But what do we do? Oh, God killed those people. Right. right. In the day that God comes and says, I love you. I don't want you to die. And you love the darkness more than you love the light. Right. And you reject God and you join yourself to death and you end up perishing. Is that God's fault? No. Is he the one that did it to you? Right? Even those stories. I mean, the things we teach our kids in Sunday school. My goodness, in the name of God blasphemed in the earth. Yeah. I mean, Ezekiel come and said, I will sanctify my name in the earth. I mean, you think, why would God have to sanctify his name? <laughs> you know, sanctify means to make clean right. or to set apart. Right. And so God's like, my name has been blasphemed. It's been sullied. Right. So I'm going to have to come into the earth and sanctify it. And he did, and we still mess up with what he did. With understanding God? Yes. Yeah, man, listen. What are you going to do? Thank God that God is long-suffering. Yes. Guess what isn't a fruit of the Spirit? Hatred. Right. Bitterness. Mm -hmm. Offense. We think God's offended. Yeah. It's a sin to be offended. That's a fr the fruit of sin, to be offended. Right. Okay. Offense means to stumble at the truth. We think God stumbled at the truth. God is the truth. God is the truth. 1 Corinthians 13. You want a great description of God? John said God is love. Go read 1 Corinthians 13 and stop thinking about how you need to love your spouse and start reading that as God. Love does this. Love does that. Now put God in there. God does this. God, God does, does that. Right. God doesn't keep a record of the wrongs committed against him, it says. Amen. Right. Says God prefers other people over himself. Says God doesn't insist on his own way. He doesn't expect us to be him. Doesn't expect us to be but him. As we lean in him, we're going to be more like him. As we lean in him, right. we'll find that he's born in us. Born in yes. us. Yes. Born in us. And you use that language because you realize that means that's not something you bring forth. Amen. Right. It's born in you. The life of God can be born in us. Right. Right? Guess who's going to give birth to it? In us? God. How does he do it? By showing himself to us. Right? Right? What is the gospel? It attacks all the lies about God and what's in God's heart towards us. Wow. Wow. And the way it does it is, death is the thing tormenting us. We thought God was the one stealing from us and killing us and destroying us. Well, God comes and he destroys death right. in the resurrection of Jesus. This death is the giant that's bringing you guys pain. You guys think that I'm against you, that I'm the one bringing you pain. I'm going to come and whoop the death's ass that is whooping you. I'm going to come and bully the death that's bullying you. So that you can see I'm your friend. Right. Yes. Right? Yes. It's like if you're a kid and you're in junior high and on the playground and you're being bullied or something. Should a guy come up and bully the bully that's bullying you? What are you going to think about that guy? He's my friend. <laughs> if the bully's busy putting you in the garbage can, or showing you, shoving you in the locker, or stealing your lunch money, mm. and then all of a sudden the toughest guy in school comes and stands next to you and says, he's with me. <laughs> and the bully is sent away. What are you going to think about the guy that come and said, he's with me? Yeah, he's he's my friend. <laughs> right? It's the same thing with God. Jesus, the friend of sinners. The very word faith within the root of the word faith means to persuade someone else of your friendliness towards them. To persuade someone else that you're their friend. That's what God's busy with. You know what you feel like if you think God's your friend and he's with you everywhere you go? 
Light and breezy. That's right. <laughs> la, 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 la. Listen, my friend Fan was a bit of a maniac. And he had like superhuman strength. Because when I attacked him on Bourbon Street, that just happened to be the time where I was my strongest. And I was a working out fanatic. And it wasn't when I was running and training. I abandoned that. So I put on like 20 pounds of lean muscle. I had an eight pack. I was strong. And I thought, I'm going to come smack this guy around. I couldn't even break out of his bear hug. <laughs> right? So there's like a superhuman strength yeah. in that guy. I've never seen that guy lose. I've seen like five people try to take him out. And I've seen him stand up out of all of them. Wow. Right? So guess what I wasn't doing? You know, when I went to high school, people were rowdy. Like at any given moment, you could be jumped. Someone could hit you in the back of the head. Someone could hit you from the side, whatever. Right? You're, you got a bunch of teenage boys getting drunk. And you got a bunch of teenage girls running around and the boys fighting about the girls and fighting about whatever. And then you're at Mardi Gras. What do you think, what kind of thing do you think happens there? You know what I was never doing when I was out with Fant? Watching my back. Yeah. You know what I was never doing when I was out with Fant? Looking out the corner of my eye, watching around. Do you know why I wasn't doing it? Because I knew he was. Yeah. And so I'm just, yeah. Let the good times roll. Les bon temps roule. <laughs> right? Because Fant's there. Fans watching. Fans got it. Fans got my... That's how it is with God, man. Right? And you become set free from fear and worry and wondering and looking around. You know God's doing it. Yeah. Right? Right? And then you begin to live in liberty. Right. Liberty, once liberty manifests in your heart, then the fruit of the Spirit comes out of you. Right? Yes. Absolutely. Mm. What do you guys think? This is always awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's one of the best so revelations of the Father we've talked about in a long time. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for the start, Louie. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it just the blood of the turnip. It yeah, just right. it just it just wouldn't go away. I'm like, oh my God, that is so awesome. And you know why that stuck with me? Because when I moved to Colorado, I didn't have a degree or anything, and the only job I could get was at a laundry place and at a finance company. Well, the finance company did in-house uh, accounts receivables. So they worked with their own customers. They didn't send it out to collection agencies. And so when I become the manager of the accounts receivable and the accounts placeable, you know how many times I heard you can't get blood out of a turnip? <laughs> when, when people would call with money problems. You know how many times I heard you can't get blood out of a turnip? Right? And it's like, yeah, I get that. You can't get money out of somebody if they don't have money. If they had the money, they would want to pay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> and so that, that phrase just always stuck with me, and it's the same thing with God. Yeah, that's amazing. God has life in himself. Yep. Jesus said that. And he's given that I could have life in myself. I am the resurrection and the life. Within me is a life that overcomes death. I can't be the one who has death in myself to give and the one who conquers the death. Because that would be a house divided against itself, right. and a house divided against itself can't stand. I can't be the one who gives death and the one who gives life. Just like Jesus when he was casting out the demons. And they said, you're casting out the demons by the power of Beelzebub. Right. You're casting out the demons because you're the head of the devil. And Jesus come and said, "Uh, a house divided against itself can't stand. I can't be the one sending the demons and the one casting out the demons. (laughs) Right? Right. Can't be. Right. Right. So we can't have God being the one who sends the death and the one who gives the life. (laughs) A house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life. Well, we already had death. That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. Yes. No, it was excellent. Very good. Very, very appropriate. Hallelujah. That's really all you need. It's really that simple. Right. Now, you, have, you could have a bunch of thoughts about God that need to be unwound, but really all you need to see is the unshakable, unbendable, unflappable, infallible goodness that is in the Father's heart towards your life. Amen. That's really all you need to see. That's it. That's all you need to know. And that sounds simple, but guess what? There's a whole lot of things in this world trying to convince you otherwise. (laughs) And so while it is a simple truth to come to, there's a whole lot of arm wrestling going on. Because the world comes and says, -uh." Nuh-uh. Nuh-uh. Yeah, look here. Right. Look, look here. Look, look at that. Yeah. What do you say about that? I mean, Jesus knew as the Son of Man, the unflappable, the unshakable, the unbendable, the infallible goodness of God, and in, that was in God's heart, in the Father's heart towards Him, 
But what did the world come and say? Where's your God now? Look at you. Right. See what it tried to do? Yeah. It tried to question his thinking about God. And whether God was with him. Right. And whether God would uphold his life. Right. And whether God would clothe him. That's what it tried to do. Yeah. That's what it tries to do to us. Right? Look yeah. at the fruit in your life. Is God really with you? Does God really love you? How could that be going on? Right. If you don't like it, you think God likes it? Yeah. Come on, man. Ezekiel 16 says, Behold, I walk by them in their blood. Mm-hmm. And what does it say? And it was the time for love. And I spread my skirt over them. That's a sign of a wedding in Jewish language. The canopy. The chupa. Right? And so what does it mean to be in your blood? To be dead in your sin. And so God says, I walked by you when you were dead in your sin. And behold, my heart breathed after you. My heart said, it's the time for love. My heart said, that which I've always dreamt for my life, I found in you. Everything I've ever desired for, love, for a love relationship and for life, I see it in you. Right. And so I spread my skirt over you. <laughs> right? Wow. Same thing with Adam. Clover. Right in the middle of a uh, smoking pot and telling him you just like it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Listen, I told God many things. I cussed God out. I told God his gospel sucked. I told him he sucked. I, you know, all sorts of stuff. There was no, honestly, that's a great place to be. And he always bear hugged you. Yeah, he always bear hugged me. That's exactly right. At least you're being raw. God's just trying to get you to be raw. Exactly. Just be raw. Mm-hmm. Here's where I'm at. Yeah. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah, because I think sometimes we think that he can't, right? We think that that our rawness is more than he can handle, which is totally a lie. Yeah. That's right. You find you talk to God like your best friend. I mean, recently, listen, the coronavirus thing's been going on for a while, and I mean, I've had peace and joy the whole time, but lots of people I know are going back and forth from upsetness and struggles, and a lot of people are suffering, like with jobs and money and stuff, and so I'm not indifferent to the suffering just because I have peace. I'm not like, well, you should have peace. What's your problem? And so there's been a couple of times, that, like, I think the last time, like two months ago, where I just said to God, like I would say to my friend, come on, man. Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> Not like he's the one sending it to us, but man, I know. some of these people need a bone. Yeah. And I know you don't think we're dogs. So can we get some crumbs? You just start being raw with God. And then what happens is, what happens when you plop your heart on the table and you're raw with God, is it you're making your heart available to God for him to minister to it, right? right? And then God starts ministering eternal life to your heart, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then God, you know, immediately in my heart, I hear God say, labor for the meat that, don't labor for the meat that perishes, but labor for the meat that doesn't perish, right? Mm-hmm. And then immediately I found my heart praying for all the people sure. and praying about God's will, yeah. that eternal life enter the earth, that the darkness be swallowed up, that people have eternal life. And then right. you just start praying for people, mm-hmm. right? Amen. Amen. That's good. Good stuff. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Louie. Hallelujah. You. you guys Thank are you awesome. Greg. <laughs> oh, I definitely need a copy of that. Well, yeah, that was really since it was.